Hey, hey, hey. I got to pour myself my uh, my chocolate hot drink for the day. This is Ben Greenfield, by the way. Um, it's the afternoon, and I like to drink relaxing things in the afternoon. I'm not a coffee guy, so I'm drinking some uh, some Rishi and a little bit of dark chocolate and some stevia here. Pour this, pour this bad boy into my cup before I tell you what we're about to listen into today. Take a sip. Maze bombs. It's even foamy. Um, hey, extreme Okinawan strength. Um, one of the best books on low back pain and core stability that I've read in a very long time. Uh, three of the best ways to fix low back pain, the best core exercises, a whole lot more. I got the world's leading expert on low back strength and fixing low back pain on the podcast today. His name's Stu McGill. You're going to love him. Trust me. Um, we even talk about uh, sex and low back pain. And the reason I say that is because yes, it's a, it's a segue. I want to tell you about, uh, gains wave, which is this amazing solution for men who want to optimize their sexual performance and who are like me fighting an uphill battle against everything from secondhand smoke to pollutants, to toxins, to EMF, to all this stuff that interferes with the performance of your nether regions. Women run into the same issue. Uh, and uh, if you're having problems in the bedroom or you just want to you know, go from good to great with the sex that you have, have better orgasms, um, get it on more, uh, there's this uh, company called Gainswave, and they do this safe, non-invasive, non-drug treatment that allows you to have better erections and better sex and both males and females to have better orgasms. It's pulsating sound waves. Uh, that increase blood flow to your crotch allows you to get uh, more blood flow. Breaks open old blood vessels, builds new blood vessels, allows more oxygen and more nutrients to get delivered to you. And so that means better sensation, better orgasms. Uh, I've even found my libido has gone through the roof. I do this thing every few months. It's amazing. Um, and doesn't require any drugs or any pills, or anything like that. You just go to gainswave.com slash Ben, just like it sounds, G-A-I-N-S wave, gainswave.com slash Ben. And um, all you got to do is just mention this podcast or my name, uh, which is kind of redundant because this podcast is called The Ben Greenfield Show. Uh, and you get 30% off any treatment with them. Well, your, your first treatment with them. 30% off your first treatment with them. Uh, so gainswave.com slash Ben gainswave.com slash Ben. This podcast is also brought to you by the Daily Burn. Um, it's pretty cool. So the Daily Burn, what they do is on-demand video workout programs. So you go there, uh, you select which video workout program that you want to do, and they literally have thousands of classes for every level of exercise or huge amount of depth and variation. I mean, like cardio, yoga, kickboxing, dance. They take way less time than getting in your car and driving to the gym. They cost way less than fancy exercise equipment. They require really little to no equipment, and you can stream over 600 different workouts taught by a huge variety of different experts. Like they have this one called Inferno that's crazy. It's like this 21 day challenge where, uh, just like it sounds like, like you go to the absolute limits. They have one called Black Fire with Bob Harper, which is pretty cool. They have one called 365, which is just like beginner friendly workouts. They start every day at 9 a.m. Eastern time, and they're just like on demand for the next 24 hours after that. They've got tactical body weight training. I mean, like you name it, it's on there. Um, when I've been bored and wanted to do like a yoga class and didn't want to actually drive to yoga, I've logged into their yoga platform. Boom, 30 minute yoga class right there. I just turn it on and do it. So daily burn is what it's called. And uh, you get a free 60 day trial with them. You just go to dailyburn.com slash Ben. That's dailyburn.com slash Ben. Usable anywhere on a connected device. Dailyburn.com slash Ben. Free 60 day trial. In this episode of the Ben Group of Fitness Show. If we take a thin willow branch, we can bend that back and forth, and it doesn't build up cumulative stress. It's not an issue. But if you took a thick branch and even bent it once to the same amount of bend, it would shatter because the stress in a round tube, which is your spine, is a function of its diameter. So 
great trainers not only create great hardware in people's bodies, but great software. And it's those default software patterns that allow people to move in a resilient, confident way all day long throughout life. He's an expert in human performance and nutrition. Voted America's top personal trainer and one of the globe's most influential people in health and fitness. His show provides you with everything you need to optimize physical and mental performance. He is Ben Greenfield. Power. Speed. Mobility. Balance. Whatever it is for you that's the natural movement. Get out there. When you look at all the studies done, studies that have shown the greatest efficacy. All the information you need in one place. Right here, right now on the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Hey folks, it's Ben Greenfield here. I get a lot of questions about, of all things, the back. Uh, People ask me about the immune system and they ask me about erectile dysfunction, and they ask me about putting fat in your coffee, but gosh, one of the questions that's way up there is the back. How do you fix back pain? How do you how do you decode back pain? And are crunches really all that bad? And how can you get good torso strength without throwing your back out? And how can you keep your glutes, quote, turned on, unquote? And is there a way to fix your back without going into a chiropractic doc over and over again? And so, you know, I, I decided it was high time that I got one of, if not the uh, world's leading low back experts on the podcast to clear up all the confusion and the clutter about your back and about your spine. Uh, and his name is Dr. Stuart McGill. He's uh, been a professor of spine biomechanics at the University of Waterloo for over 32 years. He's got well over 200 different scientific journal papers that he's authored. He's mentored over 40 graduate students, and uh, he's a consultant uh, that provides expertise to to individuals, to professional athletes, to various government agencies, corporations, legal firms, teams, you name it, specifically when it comes to low back health, and specifically when it comes to a scientific and even, as we'll describe in today's show, a a quantifiable approach to low back health and the elimination of low back pain. Now, as I usually do, uh, because uh, Stu's going to be a wealth of resources for you guys, anything that we talk about or bring up, uh, including Stu's fantastic books, he's got some really good ones, including a brand new one called The Gift of Injury, and we'll fill you in on that one. Uh, just go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash McGill. That's M-C-G-I-L-L. And when you go there, I will provide links to everything that you are about to discover. So straighten up in your chair if you're sitting in one of those fancy low back supporting chairs uh, and uh, tune in because we're about to take a deep dive into your back. Stu, welcome to the show, man. Oh, thanks very much, Ben. Good afternoon to you. Yes, sir. And and you know what? Before we even started our recording today, now now this is hot on my mind. I got to ask you because I'm I'm very curious. Um, I was kind of throwing a few different therapies at you. You know, we're talking about chairs and decompression belts and you know foundation therapy and all these things. And you said that uh, that your approach to everything is that you quantify and that you're one of the few guys out there who actually quantifies any of these modalities that are out there. When it comes to management of or elimination of or strengthening of uh, the low back or low back pain, what do you mean by that? Like how, how do you actually quantify whether or not something's working when it comes to your back? Well, that's a, a, a great start. Uh, as a professor, I ran several research operations. The first one was what we called the in vitro laboratory. We would take real cadaver spines from different animals and and humans. And if, you know, we can't get 50 identical humans, but we could get 50 identical animals. And there's not a medical question that is asked where animals aren't involved in some way, shape, or form because they add control to to the initial level of investigation. So we would load spines and create specific injuries. So we would learn very specifically what is required to create a certain type of disc herniation or bulge or how you fracture an M plate or tear ligaments, et cetera, et cetera. 
The second laboratory that we ran in tandem was what we called the in vivo laboratory that was equipped to measure loads in real people and stress in the different tissues. So we would measure the three-dimensional motion of their spines. We would build a virtual spine in the computer, their own customized three-dimensional anatomy, which we would acquire from their MRI slices that we'd build up their own bodies. And then their virtual spine would move as they moved their own spine. We would detect it and then drive their virtual spine. And then as their brain activated muscles to perform different tasks, and sometimes the tasks were very simple. Sometimes they were world-class performance. We've, we've measured, as you know, top athletes in many different sports. The muscle activation was sensed through sensors called electromyographic yeah. electrodes. EMG. EMG, exactly. And then we use those signals to drive their virtual muscles. Then we could uh, measure uh, muscle forces, ligament loads, disc and vertebra loads. And finally, we got to some very high level uh, estimates of things like spine stability. And if I was to say to you, how stable is that bridge you're building in a hurricane? If you're an engineer, that would be a, a, quite a feat of engineering to put a number on that. Well, that was what we endeavored to do, to actually measure spine stability. So we're not hand-waving about it. And if you want me to explain the three major elements that determine spine stability, I'd be willing to do so. The third level of evidence over those 30 or so years came from the clinic, where we would see patients and we would say, all right, these are uh, tests now that we think are going to stress different tissues and we're going to see if they indeed replicate your pain or take your pain away. Uh, we're going to measure stability and see if we can come up with new muscle patterns, motor patterns, movement patterns, exercise regimens, different rest break uh, periods. That was very much part and parcel with this new gift of injury book to see uh, how we can then uh, advise people. The fourth element was the proof. Does this indeed work? Then we would do population studies. We used military groups, police, firefighters, different sports teams, and we would try interventions to see if A, we could reduce the risk of future back pain, and B, what was the efficacy of different uh, approaches for those who already had different types of back pain. And there is no such thing as back pain. It's like saying to someone, oh, can you give me an exercise for arm pain or head pain? You know, we wouldn't tolerate this. So we, we always had to subcategorize pain down into um, pain by different movements, different loads or different tissues or whatever the categorization uh, rubric was, but anyway, that's, that's it in a nutshell. And hmm. that's how our operation worked to try and become the primary investigator of these different things. In other words, we didn't go to other people and ask their opinion. We, we just did the primary work. Yeah. It's an interesting approach, basically, uh, injuring the, the spines of, of unfortunate little mice <laughs> among other things and seeing what actually works. A lot of times you'll see folks, We'll say, well, this worked in, in such and such an athlete. There'll be a lot of cases of N equals one, or this worked to fix my back pain, therefore you should try it. I don't run into a lot of people who are actually quantifying in the way that you quantify. And I actually want to ask you in a little bit about some of the things that you found through that quantification, because there's a lot of popular things out there that people do that I'm, I'm curious whether or not you found actually worked. But before we dive into that, um, you, you mentioned the three major elements that influence spine stability. Um, I'm assuming that none of those are those giant leather belts that you wear at the gym when you lift weights? Well, actually, they are. Oh. Yeah, that, that would be uh, uh, part of it. Um, do you want me to talk about those three very briefly, and, and yeah. I'll work that belt comment in for you? Sure. Okay. Well, the first one is uh, the spine is a flexible rod. Now, it allows you to dance and move and throw a baseball and swing a golf club and do all these fun things. But if you're a power lifter and you're going to squat a thousand pounds, you must have virtually almost zero movement in that flexible rod because that flexible rod will collapse. 
So the role of the muscles is to act as a guy wire system supporting the front, the sides, and the back uh, to allow that flexible column to bear hundred, well, half a ton of compressive load. So a belt that the weightlifters and powerlifters wear add to the stiffness. There's no question that that extra stiffness allows them to bear a few more pounds without buckling and and even micro buckling at, at at the very low level. Now, just to interrupt you real quick, uh, that doesn't mean that that's a belt that should be used as a crutch. That would be something you'd use when subjecting the spine to an unnaturally high load. That's not something one would wear throughout the day or as a regular practice at the gym, right? And and the reason I ask that is I'm under the impression that that you lose the, you lose the ability to to stabilize. Precisely. I actually wrote legislation for several companies and a couple of government agencies on belt wearing administrative belt wearing. Do you remember years ago you would go into Home Depot and you would see all the guys wearing belts? Yeah, the guys on the forklifts are sitting there slouched over with a belt on. At one time, was a mandatory condition for employment, and and we were quite involved in in that. Um, so, of course, that is not what we're talking about, um, because there's on average, it's not justifiable for the average working guy. It's not really justifiable for guys at the gym either, unless they are trying to. Uh, push their bodies to lift a heck of a lot of load or they want to set a record. Um, There's no question that the belt will help you bear uh, a few more pounds. But the downside of it is if a person's starting to get back pain and they keep doing the thing that's causing the pain, but now they are wearing a belt thinking that they're protected, what we do know is the injury, if they're wearing a belt, is actually more severe, and that makes perfect sense. So address the cause, and the belt in that situation is probably not the cure. <laughs> okay, got it. So so when it comes to the three major elements that influence spine stability, uh, the, the belt isn't one of those elements, but the belt provides the same type of stability that one of those elements would? Yes, that's correct. So the muscles acting as a guy wire system all around the spine is principle number one. But let's forget about the belt now. I'm just giving you the three principles. So the muscles okay. need to activate, and that's why when we develop spine stabilization exercises, we treat all of the muscles acting like a, a fine orchestra would, as they all play together to ensure what we call sufficient stability. So if you're just uh, bending over to pick up your two-year-old, you don't need maximum stability and stiffness, but you need enough control, just enough. Now, if you're walking and you've got a sore back, you may need to add a little bit more stiffness, and, and we would cue that clinically but that that would be a a low level of tuned stiffness. But again, if you were lifting a couple hundred kilos in a deadlift, you'd want obviously a lot more uh, stiffness. So that's the first element. The second element is what we call proximal stability to unleash distal athleticism. Consider this for a moment. Uh, I'm sure the listeners know what a pec major is, the bench press muscle. So distally or on the other side of the ball and socket joint of the shoulder, that muscle attaches to the humerus of the arm. So it flexes the arm around, but it also connects to the rib cage proximally or closer to your core. So if you were to uh, push a door or push an opponent in a, in a, in a combative situation, the muscle that that single joint muscle, it swings your arm around in flexion, but it also collapses your rib cage towards the arm. So that's not a very effective push. But if you were to stiffen down the core, 100% of that muscle activity is directed to swinging your arm around. So, you know, when we hear Venus Williams grunt when she uh, serves a tennis ball, that, if you know what I mean by that, that super drives the stiffness in her core through the grunt so that more miles an hour are on her arm and eventually to the tennis racket to get a a few more miles an hour on the ball. So proximal stability, it's very important. You can't even walk if you don't have an appropriately stiffened core. You can imagine a child at the neurology ward at the children's hospital who has a paralyzed quadratus lumborum on one side. Mm -hmm. Say it's on the right side. They could 
leg and swing their left leg and walk. But when they stood on their left leg to swing their right leg, the pelvis on the right side drops down because that lateral stability and holding up the pelvic floor and the spine uh, is it's, it's with the hip musculature on the stance side, but also quadratus lumborum on the other. So you see, you can't even walk if you don't have proximal stiffness to allow your legs to to uh, move and transmit the hip-generated power to the legs. Okay, so before we move to number three, we basically have the proximal stability, and this would be elements such as strengthening the, the quadratus lumborum and some of those elements around the spine. In fact, every muscle is important. It plays a role, yeah. Okay, yeah, and I know you have a few exercises to do that I wanted to ask you about. And the number, the, the first one was the actual ability of the spine to flex properly? No, it was to bear load. See, it's a flexible rod. Load. Now, okay. if, you're, if your uh, spine was like a femur, like a stiff, rigid bone, you could load it in compression and it wouldn't collapse. But it's more like a stack of oranges. <laughs> so mm-hmm. if you loaded a book on the top of a stack of oranges, they'd all fly apart unless you stiffened all of those oranges together by putting guy wires around them or wrapping them in duct tape or something like that that would give them stiffness. Okay, got it. Yeah. Got it. And then what's number three? The third one has a more direct relationship with pain. When people hurt a joint, it becomes slightly unstable so that there's micro movements there. So consider a knee joint. If someone damages the uh, ACL uh, ligament of the knee, the doc or the clinician will do a drawer test. They pull the lower leg forward, and they'll see a little micro movement in the knee. And if that causes pain, the person will say, ouch, that you just hurt my my knee. So sheer load in a joint shows you how much micro movement or instability there is in a joint. So when someone gets a disc bulge or they crack an end plate or something like that, which is quite common, the disc loses a very slight bit of height. Now imagine letting a little bit of air out of your cart the car is a little bit sloppy on the road now and that's what happens to that particular level in the spine you get a little micro movement and we have clinical tests to detect this but if we teach a person an appropriate stiffening strategy by turning on their abdominal wall just again you tune it to take the pain away you engineer or stiffen out the micro movements and their pain is gone so let me give you an example take a person uh, and they, they are standing upright and they just go up on their toes and bounce down onto their heels. And that's a, that's a impact load of about one and a half times body weight down the spine. Some people will say, Oh, that just caused my pain. That was a bona fide pain trigger. Then we would say, I would poke my fingers into their oblique abdominal wall, not in front by the navel, but around a bit more towards each side. And I'd say, push my fingers out a little bit. Now repeat the heel uh, bump. And they might say, oh, doc, you're amazing. You just took my pain away. No, we didn't. We stiffened out the micro movement. So it was a, a, a one-to-one. But the, the, the patient may very well say, you know what? That pushing my fingers out caused me a compressive penalty because it, it, turning on the abdominal wall adds a bit of compression to the spine. And they might say, you know what? That just increased my back pain. Now you've just proven that the tolerance of the spine for compression isn't there yet. So you've got a little bit of healing to do before you can uh, take advantage of that stiffening pattern to engineer out the micro movements. But anyway, there, there, there are the three major explanations from someone who's, who's measured <laughs> yeah. what the spine stability is. And in a nutshell, it helps you control pain if you have it. It allows you to walk, run, cut, play tennis. Uh, it allows you to dance and move uh, under control, and it allows you to bear a uh, load down a flexible rod. It's non-negotiable, and it, it's absolutely essential for every uh, human. Okay, so you have, I know, because it's, it's pretty popular, and you run into these online sometimes, the Stuart McGill Big Three Back Exercises. Is it safe to say that if someone were to do those three exercises each day, and I want to ask you what those are in a second, that they would that they would address most of those parameters that you just talked about? Is that why you designed those big three exercises? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so what are they? 
Well, uh, I'll just give a little bit of a backdrop now. Uh, we didn't really invent any of them. Those were the three exercises that kept bubbling up to the top when we tried to find exercises that ensured spine stability, provided the stiffness to uh, achieve the three uh, reasons that I, I, I just mentioned uh, earlier, and they spared the spine. They were easy on a person's back who uh, their back is a little bit tender. It's a little bit sensitized now. And the fourth thing that we've just, we would hear sprint coaches and gymnastics coaches and uh, some professional uh, strength and conditioning coaches in, in um, uh, NFL football. They would say, you know what, after doing those exercises, the guys can run a little faster. They can cut a little bit harder. And we were experiencing the same thing. P patients would say, you know what, I'm, I don't have pain for an hour after doing them. When we investigated the mechanism, it turns out that neurologically, you add a little bit of stiffness to your core, to your spine, for on average about an hour or so after you've done that session. And it's very helpful for some people and obviously not helpful at all uh, in others. But that's uh, how those three exercises bubbled up. The first one for the back is the bird dog. You go on to your hands and knees, you extend one leg and one arm and hold it for 10 seconds and then you sweep the floor with your hand and, and knee just about the shoulder and ball and socket joint. So it's, it's also to create that movement engram. And there's all sorts of little features that people don't realize because the exercises are so simple. For example, uh, it activates the right side latissimus with the left side glute maximus. That's exactly how you walk. It's how you run. It's, it, it, there's pairings of muscles that go together, and they're called PNF patterns. And all these exercises incorporate these uh, patterns naturally in them. And say you have a client who's just had knee replacement or hip replacement. They can't get down onto their hands and knees. So we have regressions of the exercise forms, they can do a bird dog standing at the kitchen table, for example. For the side, there's the family of side planks. Um, both feet are not stacked. That was a mistake, and I can tell you the story about how that occurred if, if you want. So you don't stack one foot on top of the other for the side planks? We were asked by the American College of Sports Medicine in the 90s to put together their spine stabilization program. They were late in the uh, production of the book, you know, the protocol for uh, prescribing exercise. I forget the name of the textbook now. But anyway, uh, we'd submitted all of our figures, and their artist was drawing the three basic forms of the exercises. And for the side uh, plank, the editor said, oh, we're behind. Just trust us. The, the, the artist will draw it properly. The artist drew the feet together, and that's how it became the standard. It was a pure editorial mistake. And ever since then, wow, we've been... because everybody does, like the easy version, right? They, uh, hey, if you're in the back of the room and, and you're embarrassed, you don't stack your feet together because that's considered to be too easy, right? Right, but the top foot should be in front because that allows the person to transition from a side plank, roll over their toes to a front plank, and then roll over to the other side. Mm -hmm. And it allows you to really progress the exercise with progressions. But there's some young kids on the, on the Internet, you know how they are. They, oh, McGill, you, 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 you don't know what you're talking about. The feet should be stacked. And I said, look kid. I was the guy who wrote that program in the first place, and I know it was an editorial mistake on how that I became know, those the darn, anyway. Those darn whippersnappers. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so so we've got the side plank, the opposite arm, or the bird dog. What's the last one? And the last one is what we call the modified curl up for the front. So here the person lays on their back. Now, in, in some Pilates schools, for example, they instruct people, flatten your back to the floor, imprint it to the floor. That actually stresses the discs. If you keep the natural curves, the, the, the spine is more tolerant of load than the average person. So we say, put your hands, palms down under the uh, lumbar region of the spine. Support that natural curve. Now, bend one knee. And the reason that you bend one knee is it takes the stress off the neural system. It takes a little bit of load off the sciatic nerve roots, etc. Just, again, 
for for on average to de-stress the pain triggers a bit and then slightly raise the head and shoulders and the operative word there is slightly then you hover your head and shoulders just an inch or so off the ground and people will be surprised how difficult that is then lift the elbows up uh, and then after that of course we can switch over to things like stir the pot and and progress from there but there's the beginning of uh stabilization exercises the big three very tolerable and uh people uh look at them and think they're simple and and they're surprised to hear that some of the top athletes even some of the top power lifters of the world find they enhance performance by improving the core stiffness and unleashing their hips for a better hip hinge etc now, this curl-up move, and, and by the way, for those of you listening in, just go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash McGill, and I'll put photos of each of these exercises if you had trouble wrapping your head around how those actually go. Uh, but but the, uh, the curl-up exercise, it's like a crunching motion, and you see a lot of people say, I, I believe, and I may, I may be misquoting him there, but I think Paul Check, who I had on this show a, a couple of times, I believe I've even seen him see that, say this, is this idea, and, and Paul, if you're listening, I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm misquoting you on this, but uh, some people talk about how the back is like a credit card and you're not supposed to bend it over and over again, yet this curl-up exercise that you recommend seems to be bending the back over and over again. Uh, are you on board with this idea that you're not supposed to do, say, like crunches because those damage the spine? The word is it depends. Now we can have a really interesting discussion that could take the rest of the podcast or, or it can be three sentences. It's up to you. But I, here it is sort of in a nutshell. It depends on the person. If they have a history of back pain and you assess them and you determine that their pain triggers are flexing their spine forward, it doesn't make sense to do full curl-ups you will cause them back pain. If they've never had back pain and they don't do a lot of flexing in other exercises, it's probably not a big deal. So there's a start of the discussion. But now uh, there's no such thing as an ideal exercise for everyone. And let's start with this idea that anatomy matters. If we take a thin willow branch, we can bend that back and forth and, and it doesn't build up cumulative stress. It's not an issue. But if you took a thick branch and even bent it once to the same amount of bend, it would shatter because the stress in a round tube, which is your spine, is a function of its diameter. So there's a guy in Brazil who's on YouTube and he does, I forget how many thousands of sit-ups in a row in, in a little bit of a sit-ups and curl-ups in, in a, in a, I don't know why he was doing it, but he was. And, uh, you know, some kids on the internet once again said, look, what do you think of this, Miguel? This guy's, and I said, well, I don't really even need to see him. I can tell you that he will be a small, slender guy because he has a willow branch for a spine. No problem. But if you take an NFL offensive tackle who by definition has a thick spine, you will find that they will cause stress points in their discs by doing full curls much faster than a slender person. So there's just an example of how, uh, because of our architecture and anatomy, uh, different people uh, have different exercises. The exercises are just tools, Ben, as, as you know. And you have to match the tool with the best risk reward. But, uh, you know, then I'll, I'll be asked to consult with, say, a jiu-jitsu team or a mixed martial arts gym and... Uh, well, you know, there's some, some very interesting groups in jiu-jitsu, which is a lot of flexion to, to train in guard and, and put on submissions and whatnot. It's a lot of spine flexion. Well, uh, they might wake up in the morning, put their hands, palms down onto the floor and do uh, two or three hundred sit-ups and curl-ups and whatnot, which is fine till they're about 22 or 23 years of age. And then a few of them, because they come to consult with me, I know this, the, 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 their backs start to get painful to the point where they can't train anymore and they are now out of competition. Well, we've restored a few top-level careers by saying, stop doing the curl-ups and instead do the stir of the pot. So you get on your toes 
and you plank and have your elbows on a, on a gym ball. Now okay. swirl the ball around in little circles. Now it gets really interesting. When you do a curl up, you activate the abdominal wall to about 60% of maximum neural drive. So you're only training at 60%. When you do stir the pot and you roll the ball forward, or you do a push-up and you walk out forward with your hands, you can now drive the abdominal wall to 100% with a neutral spine. There's no curve so, at all. So if you're, if you're traveling, for example, say you're like waiting for an airplane or, and you don't have access to a big old stability ball, you would get into a push-up position and maintaining that planked push-up position, walk your hands as far out in front of you as possible? Well, within reason, because okay. you will now drive your abdominal wall to 100% of maximum neural drive. That's 100% strec- strength effort if you keep walking forward. So if you're untrained, you're going to tear something. But if you're well-trained, you now see the difference. You can do a 1,000 curl-ups at 60%, or you can do a few walkouts to 100% neural drive, and what a difference to your athleticism. And some of these jujitsu fighters then come back to me and say, you know, I had no idea. The curl-ups were inhibiting my performance because I was only training at 60%. We now do your exercises, Our back pain is gone, and we're training at 100%, and we kick and punch harder. Hey, I want to interrupt today's show to tell you about seared steaks and warm lemon salsa verde, roasted broccoli and sweet potato, chicken and kale orange salad with spicy tahini dressing. And yes, I'm using my sexiest voice to tell you about these amazing foods. Those are all Whole30 approved recipes. Whole30 does these really great tasting, guilt free meals. And then what they've done is they've partnered with another company called Blue Apron. And I've gotten a few of these meals delivered to my home and they knocked the socks off of any of the other food deliveries that I've gotten because they're, they're just fresh, they're guilt free. They're easy to prepare. The recipe cards are super simple to follow. Blue Apron, they even have a wine plan where you can get bottles of wine from renowned winemakers delivered monthly along with your food. They've got two-person meal plans. They've got family meal plans. And they have this new Whole30 thing where you get Whole30 approved recipes for eight weeks starting on February 22nd. They're going to do eight weeks of those delicious Whole30 recipes. So sign up before then. Uh, it's all non-GMO ingredients, meat with no added hormones, real, not to overuse the term, but guilt-free stuff. Uh, and you get to learn how to cook if you don't know how to do that by using their handy-dandy recipes. Uh, so they're treating any of my listeners to $30 off your first order. Just go to blueapron.com slash Ben. That's $30 and free shipping over at blueapron.com slash Ben. Now, whether I'm eating my Blue Apron meals or any other meal, every night before dinner, I take one thing. It's it's more powerful, in my opinion, than the diabetic drug metformin in terms of its ability to be able to lower my postprandial blood sugar. It's a really good liver cleanse. Um, it is the number one fat loss supplement that I recommend, period, because it controls blood sugar so well without all the nasty central nervous system stimulants all these other fat loss compounds have in them. Uh, and it's called lean, L E A N lean. It's basically, I mean, the two active ingredients are rock Lotus extract and wild bitter melon extract, which you see a bunch of pe- these people in like blue zones using uh, these blue zones where they've got higher than, uh, how do I say it? A, uh, a high number of centenarians, a, uh, a very high ratio of, of longed livid people, longed livid people. Uh, and this stuff's called lean. It's made by Keon. Keon. Uh, and Keon is uh, my company. Keon is the company that, uh, that I created that allows me to deliver the most elegant, cutting-edge, effective solutions for your goals uh, that you're going to find anywhere on the face of the planet. So this lean stuff is one of my go-tos. Take it every single day, bar none. Travel over across the world with it uh, for my liver and for my fat loss. And my liver enzymes are super low, and I'm pretty dang lean. And I attribute a great deal of this to uh, to popping two lean capsules before every meal every night. Not before every meal of the day, but like I take two at night. 
every meal of the day would get exhausting. Two at night. It's called Lean, and you go to getkeon.com. You'll see it right there. Click on Lean, uh, and your code to get 10% off is BEN10. That's BEN10 over at getkeon, K-I-O-N, getkeon.com. Is this related to this concept that you talk about? Because I've seen this in articles you've written before of Okinawan strength. You have this concept called Okinawan strength. Is what you just described what you're referring to, or is that something else? It's something else, actually. I'd be happy to. Yeah, I'm very curious about that. What what, what exactly is I assume it goes beyond just like eating rice and fish. Yeah, well, Okinawa is a small island south of Japan, and it's it's actually a base for the U.S. Navy. But uh, and, and Marines, I believe. But anyway, uh, Okinawa has a very interesting martial arts culture. And one of the positions of strength to bear a lot of load in Okinawan karate is a little bit of you stand and you adopt a little bit of a horse stance, as it's called. So slight flexion at the hips, slight flexion at the knees. And do you know in American culture, when you go to the gym and you see the males walking around, and we call it being very chest proud with the flared lats, you, you know, the you're, you're talking to a former bodybuilder. I absolutely. Uh, know. Okay, bingo. So, you know, the chest proud. Now, interesting, when we watch and measure someone setting up in a squat, uh, like a high bar back squat or something like that. If they get too chest proud, they actually lose some of their strength. Um, So one exercise we might give them is an Okinawan posture. Now, I'm I'm going to try and do this over the magic of the uh, internet. I'm going to make a small hole with my lips. I'm going to purse my lips and I'm going to blow through the very small hole. If you get the uh, uh, object of what I'm doing. And as I'm blowing through the small hole, I'm in a horse stance. I'm pulling my rib cage down. It is the opposite of the chest proud chest Mm. lift. I'm actually pulling my chest down and I'm creating a full torso compression. Now, This is called, in the Okinawan sense, putting on the iron shirt. Now, if I was to take a two-by-four and start to whack you in different places of your body, I must not find a soft spot. Well, you might find one, but that's illegal. (laughs) But don't allow a soft spot in your body. You put on the iron shirt. Pavel Satsulin, the great uh, Russian kettle master, good friend of mine, He talks about breathing behind the shield. These are all um, nuances of what I'm calling uh, in in this position of Okinawan strength. So is it for everybody? No, it's not. But it's a very good tool for the people who lose strength because they're too chest proud. Um, some, some secretaries, for example, when you, when they sit at their computer and when you ask them to sit up, they They extend their spine at the thoracolumbar junction. They don't know how to use their hips quite properly. And you you say, put your thumb where your back pain is. And they put their thumb right in the middle of their back. Uh, And and there would be a candidate for a mild form of Okinawan strength uh, training. But anyway, there's a little bit of a start to the whole explanation. So you could get into, because this sounds very similar, uh, and I know because I asked you about his name and you're familiar with it, Dr. Eric Goodman has this program called Core Foundation Training. One of the moves in there is, I, I believe he calls it a supine decompression, maybe the one I'm thinking of. It's in a plank position, and you imagine you have like an X crossing from your right elbow to your left hip, left elbow to the right hip, your knees are pressed together very hard, and you're basically planking as though you're trying to like crunch your whole body together, but it's an isometric contraction that you're holding as hard as possible, almost like you're compressing in the way that you've just described. You can hold it for maybe five seconds before you become fatigued. Is that the the type of thing that you're talking about? Uh, when when, when Yeah, that one I'm not quite familiar with. I'm much more familiar with Pavel and his organization called Strength First. And the hard style of plank is what they might call it. So you you take a plank position that's elbows on the floor and you're on your toes and you pull your elbows down towards your, your feet while you're 
uh, supported in that bridge yeah. position. Is is that yeah. somewhat the same? Very, very, very similar. Almost identical, except I think in Dr. Goodman's, your knees are on the ground and pressed together very hard uh, rather than being in a full plank position. Got it. Well, that certainly is not decompressing the spine. It will be adding compression. But nonetheless, uh, it sounds very similar. And okay. yeah, is that an exercise your grandmother should be doing? Probably not. But is it helpful for some? Yeah, it will be uh, helpful for some. So there you go. You'd be surprised. A lot of badass grandmas are listening to this show. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know what? I take that back. I I was working with uh, this woman at an MMA gym not too long ago, and she was pushing the prowler, and I, and I just had to compliment her on her form and her hip drive. And she looked at me. She says, yeah, I'm a 66-year-old grandma, you know. And I said, well, good for you. I I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, well, I'm in, the, in my sixties myself and I, I'm past that, I think. <laughs> well, speak, speaking of 60 year old grandmas, this will be a great segue. Uh, you, you talk about sex and treating and fixing low back pain related to sex. A lot of people complain of low back pain when they have sex. What, what's the link between low back pain and sex? And, and why have you written about that particularly? Aside from the fact that it's great clickbait online. Yeah, it, it, it really is. Well, let me set the stage for you uh, on this being an American, and you will get what I mean by that last comment in just a second. If you go to any primary care clinician, they will say to you, we have couples that come to us and say, we're now celibate because the last time we had sex, we knackered our backs so badly. We are now fearful of the back pain and we're not having sex anymore. So they will say that's not an uncommon uh, situation, and yet there is no guideline that exists for clinicians. They don't know what to do. They're clueless. Now, there was one manual that we found that said if, if you have painful sex, uh, try spooning. Well, me being me, I had to go to an undergraduate student and said, what's spooning? <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> so anyway, as it turns out, spooning is not a good idea. You're, you're bending the spine, and that quite often replicates the pain trigger. So one of my graduate students, Natalie Sidorkowitz, a very brave woman, decided that she would uh, work uh, together on this, and it took us two years to do all the ethics groundwork, because as you can imagine, there's no mother or father who wants to hear that their students, uh, their, their, their children might be asked to partake in a study like this at the university. And this would never have been done in a million years in the U.S. People are terrified. They'd lose their, their uh, national funding, and et cetera. But our president got behind this. Our uh, chief medical officer got behind this because of the magnitude of the problem that exists. It was a real thing. So we weren't allowed to recruit any personnel, students or faculty from the university. They all had to be at arm's length. But we had couples uh, and they uh, came into the laboratory. Uh, they were instrumented with full instrumentation. The men were instrumented by one of our male assistants and females by a female assistant. I, I know where this is going. Yeah, and then they did, uh, they had sex in several different positions, different motions, and we were measuring uh, stress on the joints. So, uh, and uh, just a, a little bit of a funny aside on that. So we're, we're in the laboratory. Uh, the lights are, are dimmed down, and uh, Natalie and I were sitting behind a curtain, actually, so we couldn't actually see them, but, you know, you hear all the, the sounds and, and that kind of thing. Um, but on our computer screens, their bodies are being recre recreated in infrared, so you've seen the, the movie uh, Avatar. We used sure. exactly the same instrumentation because real actors were driving those avatars. Well, mm -hmm. the avatars were themselves uh, per performing uh, different sex positions. Anyway, and then we would see all the signals of the muscles activating and the joints moving on our screens. And then all of a sudden, all the motion stopped. 
and uh, the muscles got quiet, and then we heard them giggle, and then we saw their abdominal muscles start to vibrate as they began to giggle, and then we, we called out and said, uh, are, are, are you two okay? And they said, yeah, we Velcroed ourselves together. <laughs> we didn't quite get the instrumentation right on the first time, and we had to go back and redesign it, but that was a little bit of a fun uh, uh, vignette, I suppose. But anyway, um, then we created an atlas. So we were able to show different positions and techniques and what spared different joints. So now uh, clinicians have access to the atlas. They test the person who has back pain. Are you tolerant of flexion or extension or uh, compression or whatever it happens to be? And if you are, then you go to this place on the chart and you say, that's a position for you that uh, won't trigger that specific back pain um, trigger. Uh, so some general rules. If the person who has back pain is on the top, uh, they are responsible for the motion and probably should be using their hips, not their back. And if it's the person on the bottom, they uh, should try and use different pillows and whatnot and buttress their, their hips and spine into a position that's resilient for their particular pain trigger. Interesting. But, uh, did you pu- did you publish this anywhere? Oh yeah, it's uh, it's been published. And now you know when you publish uh, academically. First, we had to show the male side of things, and then the EMG, and then the spine loads, and then the females, and then you have to do different validation studies and all that kind of thing. But the main um, atlas either just has come out in uh, a, f- a family uh, medicine journal or it's just about to. I'd have to ask Natalie. Oh, fascinating. So this, so this is pretty new. Oh, it's very new. Oh, yeah, this is, okay. this is world-leading. Natalie, when she presented it at the Lumbar International Society for Study of the Lumbar Spine, that's the top orthopedic spine meeting in the world. She won the prize for the top study uh, a couple of years ago. So wow. this, so this if you, is if you big, have any links, uh, send them to me, and I'll put them in the show notes for folks. It's like it's like Stu McGill's well, Kama Sutra. I, I, yeah, well, it, it kind of is like that. Um, but there's a very um, a concatenated atlas in back mechanics. So in the last chapter, we actually have a, a few pages on sex technique and mattress selection and all that kind of stuff. And and you might find this funny. Uh, not funny, but but interesting, uh, Ben. And I don't know if you want to go here. Never in a million years would I thought I would say the word orgasm in public. But it was so interesting. We were the first. We didn't know this. We were the first to measure the male uh, orgasm response in in with full instrumentation. And the, the, the Kinsey Institute, which is the repository of sexual health and science in the U.S., they're not even allowed to do this kind of work. And now they're partnering with us because uh, we, we, we obviously were doing it and, and they were most uh, interested in it. But what was so interesting in the male response is in some men, it's almost non-existent. There's not much muscle activity that goes on. In other words, they're not really at risk of hurting their backs. Even the guys who aren't drunk, huh? Uh, yeah. Uh, that, there you go, you see. There's the next level of study. See, you'd be a good scientist. You, <laughs> you just cascade yeah. into the next one. But in, but in contrast of that, there are some men who put their spine in a fully deviated position and then contract their gluteal muscles and abdominal wall 100%. So now let me ask you, put your spine in a deviated posture and then crunch your muscles to 100% effort. Do you see how you can hurt your back? And it's it's no wonder. So to show those particular um, candidates um, what it is that's causing their back pain and and really violent uh, uh, pain triggers, uh, so when you educate them, I mean, I can talk about coaching transference, which would also be very interesting for your readership or listenership. But uh, just to finish this off, coach them well, show them what causes the pain, and then show them what to do as an alternate. And most people get it. And, you know, they say, thank you. You're the first person who hasn't treated us like a five-year-old. That's all we needed to know. And 
Wow. They're back to enjoying life again. Interesting. You are you are officially the first guy to ever utter the word orgasm on the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Um, well, you know, I'm, act, I'm actually you know kidding. Say, we, ben, back pain sells. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've we've we've, <laughs> we've broached everything from THC enemas before sex to uh, to stem cell injections into the. D- so you're definitely not the first guy to bring up orgasm. We're, we're safe. Uh, the, the, the listeners know when to put earmuffs on the kids. Now, what about this concept of coaching transference that you mentioned would be interesting to the listeners? What are you referring to? Yeah, absolutely. So there are, again, Facebook discussions on uh, back pain and that, oh, you, you, you might not want to say to your client or to your patient what's causing their back pain and uh, don't mention they have a herniated disc or something like this because they will become fearful and fear, uh, fearful of movement and all this kind of thing. And I so disagree, and I have data that I'll, I'll just describe now. to to give some perspective on this. We took the Pensacola Fire Department down in in Pensacola, Florida, and broke them up into three training groups. One group trained exercise. You know the kind of exercise where you do a, a whole pile of burpees, and then you stand up and you might do a whole pile of Olympic snatches. Well, the interesting thing about that is you're trying to adapt the spine two different ways that don't add up. It's inconsistent. When you do burpees, you're building flexibility into the spine. You're loosening the collagen of the disc, which is fine, but that's if you want to be flexible. But you can't be flexible, or it's very rare for a person to gain the ability to have a lot of spine movement and then bear a lot of load in Olympic lifts. The Olympic lifters, they lock their backs and they pull with their hips. Uh, But when you do the Olympic lifting, now you're compressing the back, and uh, it's better to have stiffer collagen. That's more load resilient. Um, And then when you do 10, you start getting tired, and you break form, and you start creating stress risers uh, in the back. But nonetheless, group number one didn't get coached on the actual movements. They were coached and encouraged just to keep doing repetitions. Do another repetition. Mm -hmm. Okay. Group two did what we called the movement matters training. They had coaches from, uh, well, it's now called Exos. It used to be called Athletes Performance. Yeah, Yeah, that's Mark Verstegans. I I used to do consulting for Exos for their supplement division. Yeah, fabulous. And Mark has good coaches. They know what they're doing. So they coached the second group of firefighters in... Um, oh, watch your frontal plane knee movement, valgal collapse while you're doing a lunge. In other words, that is a predictor of ACL injury. Sagittal plane spine motion is a predictor of uh, getting back pain under high loads, for example. So they coached, they didn't use that language, but they would say, you know, watch your knee, uh, keep your spine uh, in the natural curve when you're under this load, but they never measured them doing firefighter tasks. Then when they were measured doing their firefighter tasks, after the study was finished, those who just did the fitness training for more reps had more injury movement markers when they were doing their firefighting tasks. Those who were coached on good fundamental movement in the gym, but never coached on how to do firefighting tasks, When the study was over and they went back to firefighting tasks, they completed the tasks with less stress on their bodies. That was the first study ever that proved good coaching is transferable to the activities of daily life. So if there's any trainers who think their professionalism uh, isn't absolutely a necessity, there they go. There's the first evidence they have. So, so basically, by somebody listening in to you, for example, coach on this podcast, how to do that Okinawan strength exercise, they aren't just going to get better at the Okinawan strength exercise. That's potentially something they could take out with them to, let's say, well, Home Depot to be able to lift the box better or the tennis court to be able to swing a racket with correct spinal stabilization. Exactly. It's transfer yeah. with them. So. Being a professional coach, not, it's not a matter of beating people up and, and getting them to do more reps. You can do that if you like, but it's the way that you're coaching that turns out to be uh, so, so uh, important. Gotcha. Can I just mention a thought on this? Oh, ben? go ahead. Um, 
again, this won't be for the coaches, but more of the uh, for the lay public. Um, movement is a function of your hardware, so that that's the strength of your muscles and the strength of your bones and joints to carry the loads and that kind of thing. That's why you train. You harden your body. But the second thing about training is you're changing the software. You're creating muscle memory patterns. These are called muscle engrams. So you don't think to walk. You fire off an engram or you run the computer tape and your body just runs the tape until you stumble or something and you you need your brain to fix that and recover. So training is also about developing these these engrams. So if you're a stay-at-home mom, you've got a two-year-old. No, you've got a one-year-old. And it's two o'clock in the morning and you walk down to the bedroom and you pick the baby up out of the crib at two o'clock in the morning. You go to your default engram. How good was your trainer in teaching you how to lift and doing a few practical everyday lifts as well so that they've grooved that into the software pattern? Do you you follow what I mean? So great trainers not only create great hardware in people's bodies, but great software. And it's those default software patterns that allow people to move in a resilient, competent way all day long throughout life. You need to make these patterns almost subconscious. Yes. The word from a neuroscience perspective is create Default engrams that the person that default engrams. How are you spelling? How are you spelling engrams? E n g r a m s. So the engram for walking, for example, isn't in your motor cortex. It lives in your spinal cord. So there are some people who will get a spinal cord shock, say a whiplash or or uh, some trauma like that, and they have problems walking. And the docs and the physios haven't realized that they may not have a hardware problem their engram was corrupted with mm. the violence to their spine. Interesting. Oh, yeah. Interesting. So, the, so the, okay. the, to relearn how to walk is as much about resetting that new default engram or, or correcting the perturbed one that was perturbed. And, you know, it's so interesting how those engrams can be, protect, can, can be perturbed by emotional upset, physical upset. It's, it's very different forms of fibromyalgia, for example. Movement triggered general pain can be a function of corrupted engrams. Wow, this is so interesting. All right, I got a couple other questions for you. We should save that for another podcast then. But uh, yeah, that we we could have. I, I wish we were in person. This is a beer and peanuts conversation. Yeah, well, maybe maybe someday. Maybe, maybe which which city are you in again? Uh, I, I don't live in a city. I'm about three hours north of Toronto up in Ontario, Canada. I'm looking out at yeah. feet of snow here. <laughs> yeah. And I don't get up there much. Uh, okay. Another question for you. We have a ton of listeners who are chronic repetitive motion athletes. They're like triathletes or marathoners. And I see this over and over again. People say they've got their SI joint is locked. Their SI joint is locked up. They got to go to the Cairo and get it unlocked, or they do like this self unlocking mechanism. They'll get off of YouTube or like in you know Kelly Starrett's book or or whatever. And then their SI joint gets locked again. They they blame all their low back pain and limited range of motion on this SI joint issue. What's your take on on this whole SI joint thing? Well, I'm going to start with a phrase once again that I hope you're not tired of, but the word is it depends. The SI joint's really interesting. Uh, l- 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 let me just start off w- with this perspective. There are some people who say the SI joint is bomb-proof, it doesn't move, and it's not an issue, forget about it. And my thought when I hear that is, I think they just have limited experience and expertise. I'm going to tell you a personal story. Um, y- you may or may not know I've, I've had hip replacement after uh, some substantial trauma. But uh, years ago... Uh, I uh, had hip and back pain and I I went to a chiropractor and they laid me on my side and with my hip as arthritic as it was, they couldn't do a manipulation of what they told me was a stuck SI joint. It was locked up. Right. So they got up on my iliac crest and they jumped on it and squished it down. In other words, they cracked open my SI joint by squeezing my iliac crests quite, quite heavily. Mm-hmm. Okay, now I had a loose SI joint. I had to crawl for a week 
I was in excruciating oh, no. pain in my pelvic ring. So you need a certain amount of integrity in the pelvic ring, which are the two iliac bones with the pubis symphysis at the front and the two SI joints with the sacrum uh, in, in the middle. Now, there is a little bit of movement and flexibility there. So when you do a split lunge the, and your right leg goes forward, your right ilium mutates backwards or posteriorly and your uh, left ilium, as your left leg goes back, it mutates the other way. So you do get a little bit of movement and laxity in the SI joints. If you get too much, you have a lot of pain. These are athletes like tennis players and squash players who've done way too many split lunges and they've opened up the movement in their SI to the point that it's, it, it's painful. But anyway, there's a little bit of a personal uh, perspective on SI joint pain. And, and uh, you know, <laughs> if, if, if it's locked, uh, it, it may or may not cause pain. And if it's too loose, it will cause uh, excruciating pain as well. But so in other words, like if you're constantly getting your SI joint adjusted, you may be creating laxity when in fact what you should be doing perhaps is working on some of the stability exercises that you talked about earlier. Precisely. Precisely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that makes so sense. So we, we have tests for testing the SI joints, and one of them, because of my personal experience, was we manually squeeze the iliac crest. And does that cause mm -hmm. SI joint? Then we pain. Then we squeeze the greater trochanters and see if that causes pain. Then we repeat it while the person is loaded and, and walking. And we can reveal whether there's a pain sensitivity there. And then we have other tests that directly load the, the sacrum and uh, the pelvic ring uh, to see. But uh, anyway, having said all of that, when a person says they have a locked SI joint, you know what we find? Quite often, it's not the SI joint at all. It is a dynamic disc bulge, and they bend a certain way. They get a little bit of an irritating bulge that immediately get, they get a sense as though someone put a knife into their SI joint. But it was a radiating symptom from a sciatic root, and that sciatic mm. nerve root that comes from the disc in the lumbar spine goes right by what they perceive as the sacroiliac joint, uh, behind the hip joint, and then down the thigh. So sometimes when I hear someone say, you know, my, my SI joint just got locked up as I moved or I flushed the toilet or I bent down to pick up a, a penny off the ground or whatever, what, so, well, SI joints don't really come on like that. That's much more of a discogenic, disc bulge kind of a symptomatology. And then over two weeks, that slowly winds down, and then they're quite fine again. And again, a sacroiliac joint does not wind down in two weeks. It takes months mm. and even sometimes a couple of years for that mm. pelvic ring to stiffen up once again. And uh, it takes a lot of stabilization exercise and stop doing whatever the cause is. So the character of the pain reveals whether it's discogenic or true SI. So if it's SI... It's very slow to recover, but if it's a sharp pain in the SI joint and then it's gone in two weeks again, that's probably much more likely a disc sciatic nerve root genesis. Okay, got it. One other question that I know is near and dear to the hearts of our listeners, because we got a bunch of biohackers out there hanging upside down like bats, uh, yoga trapezes and inversion tables and even the badass gravity boots. Uh, I own them all. I've used them. Uh, I actually kind of like the way I feel after I you know, get off an airplane, for example, and I've been sitting for six hours on a flight or in airports, and I want to, you know, quote, decompress, unquote, the spine or, or hang or invert. What is your opinion on inversion uh, for either low back pain or self-traction or, or even just a, a preventive measurement? You know... I'm going to start with that, with the two words once again, and that is... It depends, yeah. It depends. It really does. We've measured... Yeah, I beat you to the punch that time. Yeah, it depends, uh, and we've measured uh, the length of people's spines and hydration of the disc and that kind of thing with 15 minutes of uh, upside-down inversion from boots. Um, interestingly enough, there's no question 
the discs become unloaded and they suck in fluid. Uh, so when you stand up, you're actually taller and you've got a new imbibe of fluid in the nucleus of the disc. Now, that's all gone within 15 minutes of walking around. So is that good or bad? I, I don't really uh, know. You've given the disc a little bit of nutrition, I suppose, but have you opened up the disc space as well? It's mm -hmm. all gone after 15 minutes. But let me uh, continue on with this it, it depends discussion. Isn't it interesting that, you know, it, it, it's really difficult after you measure these things to come down to a hard answer, and I'm not trying to ev evade any of the answers, but what I have learned is w w when you give people the biological information, they can usually make their own best decisions. So that, that's what I'm trying to do with these things. But w consider instead of hanging upside down, which, by the way, for some older people, traction for the spine, on average, that's the one group that it is shown to have a little bit more efficacy at reducing back pain. So these are the ones who say, you know, after I walk for 10 minutes, I'm starting to get leg pain and that kind of thing. So traction uh, can assist, but it's, it's much better when they figure out what the, the, the cause is and then reduce the cause at the same time. But then hanging upside down, it creates pressure in your eyeballs and uh, cerebral uh, fluid pressures and whatnot. That, that may not be the best uh, for everybody. But here's a very interesting perspective on this. If you're a young guy, which I know you are, and you're on an airplane and you just want to press your, your, your back after, perhaps just go lay on your tummy and then lay on your tummy, suck in air. And as you exhale, imagine your low back falling through your stomach into the table. Just slowly work the lordotic curve back into your back after you've been sitting on the airplane. And we've measured this. If you have a little bit of a disc bulge, that is a, a mechanism that vacuums it in and allows it to decrease its size ever so slightly. Interesting. So, so, so one more time, you lay on your stomach. You lay on you your suck, stomach. You, you suck the air and then you just let the low back kind of melt into the ground. As you exhale. Absolutely. As you exhale. Now, so you're not doing this whole Okinawan strength, extreme no, no, no. contraction. This is more of an, a relaxation. Yeah. No, okay. no, that's entirely different. So just lay on the, on the floor and breathe in and let your low back fall to the floor as you uh, exhale. That adds the, a relaxation to the spine, but it restores the lordotic curve. And in some people, and, and there's a few nuances to this, for example, you need 70% of the disc height remaining or more. And if you do that, it is possible that the disc bulge gets vacuumed in. Now, if you want to super drive that just a little bit, have someone pull on your legs while you're laying prone and exhaling and relaxing. Now, in some people, if they have a lot of spine instability, they'll say, oh, stop, that makes my back feel sick. But if the person has a little bit of a disc bulge, but they have sufficient spine stability, when you pull on their legs, they'll say, ah, oh, I love that. And then you can give their legs a little bit of a shake and put a tiny bit of motion into their lumbar spine. And that even, that, that accelerates the return of the nucleus and shrinking of the disc bulge even faster. But there will some, be some people who say, oh, you know, I, I just can't stay in this prone position. I'm kind of locked in flexion after getting off the table. Well, try this. Turn your head ever so slightly on the ground and push your eyebrow down into the floor two pounds. And then they'll say, you know, that, that made all the difference in the world. And all you did was added a little anterior chain stiffness. And now all of a sudden, you made it tolerable. So do you see how there's there's nuances and nuances and nuances to all of this? Yeah. I'm going to try it, though. The next time I'm at the airport, I'm going to try this. I'll, I'll get some stranger to lay down on my legs. That shouldn't be too hard. And I'll, uh, I'll, I'll keep folks posted on what I experienced because that's, that's something I feel a lot when I get off the plane. Yeah. But hey, me too. We're both road yeah. warriors. Yeah. That's how you discover a lot of these fixes, huh? You mess yourself up and uh, you, know, you throw out your own back having sex or getting some some chiropractic doc to stand on your iliac spine and then you uh you gotta turn around and find these crazy exercises <laughs> so it's a it's a the unfortunate part of living in the trenches it isn't unfortunate that's the joy yeah. of being a professor 
That's true. It, yeah, that, it, it 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 absolutely is. It's been a wonderful career just to experiment and play, ask questions, confirm what is right, what is wrong, surprise yourself. Oh, it's it's been wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, for those of you listening in, I have taken notes and I've got links to all of Stu's books, um, but also this new book, uh, The Gift of Injury, which I'd actually like to get. If, Stu, if you're game, I'd love to get you back on the show sometime because I know you helped some power lifter, uh, you know, who went from like 1,100 pound squats and 800 pound deadlifts to, you know, completely being out of the game, basically fight his way back, and you fix this guy. And uh, then, uh, from what I understand, you you co-wrote a book with him, this Brian Carroll guy. So I might have to have you guys back on the show and have you two tag team a show with me. Uh, We'd love to. And and Brian is such an engaging personality, but he had a horrific back injury. And we did uh, what we called bone callusing to fill in the, the fractures and the damaged discs. And he remodeled back to uh, quite a normal looking spine to uh, win the Arnold's uh, a couple years ago. So there's uh, proof of the pudding. We've done that with many different uh, athletic careers, but uh, this was one that we documented all the way through and showed how we did it. So yeah. That, well, you may be getting contacted by some listeners I know who, who deal with uh, debilitating low back pain who, who want to reach out to you. So I'll, I'll put a link to your website on there as well as this book. And, and I can tell you what, tonight... Uh, maybe as a warm up for my workout, I'm going to try these big three exercises. I may also try this uh, stir the pot exercise in your hard style plank. And I'll, I'll, for for any of you all, uh, others who are listening in who want to try some of these exercises and let me know how they go for you, I'll, I'll put links to them all over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash McGill. And you can also go over there to leave your comments and your questions and your feedback. And I'll try and get everything sorted for you as much as possible. So bengreenfieldfitness.com slash M-C-G-I-L-L. Uh, Stu, this has been a lot of fun. And and again, uh, I agree. We'll have to uh, perhaps hook up and, and have a fireside chat sometime uh, up there in, in Ontario if I can make it out there. I'll, uh, I'll hop on a plane and, of course, get off the plane, have someone lay on my legs in the airport while I'm on my stomach, and then I'll, I'll hop in a car and head over to you. Ben, it sounds fabulous, and I, I, yeah. I, uh, you're, you've got the reputation you do. You're, you're very good at it, so good on you, sir. Hey, thanks, man. Well, all right, folks, I'm Ben Greenfield, along with Dr. Stuart McGill, signing out from bengreenfieldfitness.com. Have an amazing and hopefully uh, pain-free week. You've been listening to the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Go to bengreenfieldfitness.com for even more cutting-edge fitness and performance advice. 